I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, Gore, in a number of your books, uh, you uh, have uh, have discussed the notion of doubling or twins or multifaceted uh, aspects of a personality. Can you discuss your interest in this concept of doubling or twins in some of your work? You might, might have to repeat that. <laughs> My interest in doubling and twins, well, I like to think of myself as a very minor avatar of Mark Twain. What does Twain mean, twin? Two, double. And there are certain temperaments that are rather double temperaments. I often thought it might run in families. My grandmother Gore was a twin and she lost her twin at birth. And what does she do? She marries a blind man and she becomes his eyes and ears, everything, his twin. And they had a very happy marriage and he spent uh, nearly 40 years in the Senate doing more good than ill, I think. It could run in families, I don't know. I can't base much of anything psychologically on it. Though they are odd. I, I've known sets of twins. I'm sure everybody here has known them. One of them gets, you know, a throat disease and the other one has got it too, halfway around the world. And I, I, I knew a pair who were great hypochondriacs and they were constantly on the phone. Well, I, I had the electrocardiogram. No, you've got to have it. The problem is on the, it's the left ventricle. No, remember the left ventricle. You know, you forget all these things. And they do, they quarrel back and forth about common illnesses between the two of them. Luckily, I've not, not enjoyed that twinship. What's your solution uh, for the Israeli Palestinian uh, situation? <laughs> uh, let them do it. <laughs> I shall be very happy if they do it. Do you think the internet is going to change the way we think about the world, the way we think about politics, the faith we have in things that people say to us? I think the internet is, she said, will the internet change the way we think about things? Well, it's bound to. I don't know how, but we are already think in different ways. For instance, in politics, where I spend a bit of time, uh, you can get a crowd. You go on the internet in, I don't know, Anchorage, Alaska, and you can get a crowd in Idaho by just saying, meet at such and such a place, and so and so will be there, and uh, things start to happen. This is why the U.S. government has got to wreck it, because <laughs> this will bring them down. I could just make a comment on that, because um, my day job is to teach American politics. And one of, the th that one of the huge changes is that we can now sit in Australia and read your newspapers. Now, I would agree with Gore's comments about your newspapers, <laughs> but it is a very different experience to when I started teaching, when an Australian university library might get a copy a few weeks later of an American newspaper. Now, undergraduate students take it for granted that they can read say, the LA Times, at the same time as you are reading the LA Times. Um, and this, I think, does change in all sorts of ways. And I can assure you that we, in the periphery, read your newspapers. I think one of the great problems is that you, in the centre, don't read ours. <laughs> I, have, I have a question for Professor Altman and, and Gore. Uh, uh, Professor Altman, and, and would you repeat this for the outside, could you discuss your civil rights case involving Myra Breckinridge in 1969, and then go on to discuss this, the significance of Myra Breckinridge and Myron in American literature. Oh boy. Well, uh, the question was, it was, was a reference to the um, case that I mentioned in the beginning, um, the seizure of uh, Myra Breckinridge by Australian customs. Um, as I said then, the judgment ruled that Myra Breckenridge, the American edition, was obscene. And one of the glorious ironies, I was reminded of this when Gore said that sometimes a satirist, it's a bit like um, 
Alice in, in the looking glass. Satirist has to run very fast to keep up with reality. The judge justified his ruling that Myra Breckenridge was obscene by quoting from passages which also appeared in the British edition, which at the time was legally on sale in Australia. Um, but I, the other part of the question was about the significance of, of the twinned books, Myra Breckenridge and Myron. Um, I think there are a number of ways. Firstly, I think Myra Breckenridge, as I claim in the book, um, really began the revolution in many ways intellectually in thinking about sexuality and gender in the United States in a way that academics have not acknowledged. And indeed as someone who is an academic and who's written in this area, I'm constantly surprised at how theorists spend vast amounts of pages restating what Myra said but in less comprehensible language. <laughs> um, secondly, I would say that Myra Breckenridge is one of the great novels about Los Angeles. Um, I, my early images of Los Angeles came from literature. One of my early images came from Myra. I don't think I'd actually been to LA at the time that uh, I first read the book. Myra, of course, is remarkably prescient in the way it talks about the media. Um, it is those of you, and, and I have always thought, and I don't know how Gore, I don't think I've ever said this to Gore, I've actually, I actually in some ways have become fonder of Myron as a book than Myra. Um, I think this is the case where people forget that the twins actually have a quite separate existence. Um, and Myra Breckenridge has tended to outshadow her twin, who in many ways has a depth that people have, have now forgotten. But there's a wonderful insight into the way in which the culture of Hollywood, which of course is our culture, and by our I mean the world's culture, we all grow up with your images. Myra and Myron analyzed that in ways that in 2005 are still remarkably relevant. Um, and indeed, I can imagine teaching a course on American popular culture, which begins by the reading of those two books. <coughs> And the master uh, on Myra and My on Myra Breckenridge and Myron. I've got to reread them. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis has stimulated me. Do you read any? Well, there's a picture of you in the back with Tennessee Williams. You are a good friend of Tennessee Williams. Yes. During the production of Camino Real in the 1950s, he was experimenting with surrealism. He has a fascist gutman uh, around a huge boxing ring of the society, and garbage collectors come in to clean up the bodies. They climb up and down the walls like spiders. Uh, in the 1950s, they walked out on that production. Do you feel that, that that play, looking at it now in the year 2005, is really a play about America now, and not just a, about a, a society of romantics? Yeah. Well, I thought Camino Rio, which I loved, I went, I was at the opening night of it, was very much about America then. It's more aggravated now. I think we're more used to uh, awful things happening, and more trash collectors getting rid of people. Now we have hurricanes to do it. So I think uh, Tennessee had a very uh, prescient political sense. He was not interested in history of any kind or even in politics, but he quite knew where the society was adrift. And it was always ridiculous, you know, that they thought he just wrote about sex. Well, he was writing about love. Now, admittedly, the two get confused occasionally. And this is in the interest of some people to do the confusing, but Tennessee was just trying to reach out and see why it was that we were such a lonely people in our villages across the land, and he came from a small town in Mississippi. And he caught a lot of this, well, other writers have done it, but not so dramatically since he was a great playwright. 